Good morning and welcome to Calix Limited's investor webinar to discuss the company's FY23 results. Presenting today, we have the company's CEO, Bill Hodgson and CFO, Darren Charles, and they'll be running through the presentation that was released today on the ASX. Um, to ask a question, please submit them by the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll do our best to get through as many of those as possible. I'll now hand it over to Phil. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ben, and thanks all for your attention today. Uh, we just jump into the uh, the slides that we've put up on the ASX platform. Uh, first of all, just a quick introduction to Calix for those who aren't familiar with us. Uh, founded in 2005, it's a, a, of one core technology. We're developing multiple businesses, uh, really targeting uh, this area of, of sustainability and the transition to net zero. Um, we've now got over 120 employees. We've invested over 120 million to develop the technology. 28 patent families now in operation and active in seven countries across five continents. Uh, so uh, we're really uh, listed in 2018 and really starting to uh, develop the technology into multiple areas. The core technology uh, is essentially a new way to heat stuff up, a new type of kiln or furnace, if you like. Um, and in a traditional kiln or furnace, what you do is you put how you heat and what you heat in the same vessel uh, and effectively uh, the fuel and the rocks together and light a match. And it's been done much the same way for five to 7,000 years. Uh, what we do is we separate how you heat from what you heat. And we do that in a rather large uh, steel tube. Uh, that tube, uh, I've got a little roll here to sort of demonstrate that. Uh, the biggest ones were built are 1.8 metres in diameter and over 32 metres high. And we hit this tube to over 1,000 degrees centigrade. Uh, and we can do that however you like. We can do that with fossil fuels. Uh, we're looking at doing it using waste uh, and biomass to burn. And also, of course, we can heat with renewable electrons, uh, much like having some toaster elements, if you like, around the outside of the tube. So we hit this tube over to over 1,000 degrees centigrade. And whatever we're heating goes down the middle of the tube. Um, it needs to be a small particle size. Anything less than a third of a millimetre in diameter is perfect for us. Uh, and essentially what happens is we just drop those tiny particles down the tube and they float down over 20 to 30 seconds and the radiative heat from the red hot walls of the tube uh, goes into those particles and that's how we heat things up. Why do it this way? Uh, well, effectively, uh, there's several great reasons for why to do it that way. The first starts with uh, one of the applications we're developing in cement and lime. Uh, and with limestone, which is the core ingredient in cement and lime, and here's a, here's a lump here of limestone, uh, nearly half the weight of this is CO2 trapped in that rock. And when we heat up, uh, when the cement and lime industries heat up that limestone, uh, it releases that CO2. Uh, and it is mixed with the flue gases uh, of the cement kiln and out the stack it goes. Uh, now, with our kiln, uh, the particles of cement uh, meal, if you like, which is mainly limestone, float down, uh, as we've said before, gets heated by the tube. And as the CO2 comes out of those tiny particles, it's not mixed with any furnace gases. It effectively comes out the top as a pure CO2 or nearly pure CO2 stream, ready for sequestration or utilization. And so what the kiln represents for the cement and lime industries is a way to directly separate the CO2 that's coming out of the rock, coming out of their raw material. Uh, and that raw material CO2 is over half their global emissions. Uh, and so with the cement and lime industries emitting 8% of global CO2 with over half coming from the rock, you can see the reason why uh, there's interest really growing in this particular application of our core technology. Uh, the next uh, sort of key advantage I mentioned before, renewable energy ready. Having a kiln which is energy agnostic uh, and particularly suitable uh, for using electrons to power up that kiln uh, is starting to generate a whole lot of interest from mineral processing industries. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the deal that uh, we've moved through now, final investment decision with Pilbara Minerals to use the kiln to heat up spodumene uh, and spodumene fines for a lithium extraction. Uh, and there are several other applications we're developing there, such as iron and steel and, and in, in a new development that we're working on, aluminium. Uh, the last particular advantage of the technology is there's no flames and hot gases touching the particles as they fall down the tube. So we can create very highly active uh, and uh, pure, if you like, uh, products 
Uh, and those products are making their way and we're developing into uh, water treatment, uh, biotechnology and battery materials applications. And I'll touch on each of these as we run through how we've gone over the year and what our uh, targets are moving forward in those particular industries as well. So one core technology, multiple different industries. Uh, how do we sort of prioritise and target which industries to go into? They've got to be a significant global challenge. Uh, and that's really to pick up the tailwinds that are happening around sustainability. Um, it's got to be consistent with our purpose and values uh, and ethos, which is about uh, obviously uh, Mars is for quitters as a central sort of theme, but also about decarbonisation uh, and sustainability. Uh, it's got to present a significant market share. Uh, so we're not targeting small markets. These are big problems and uh, big problems to solve and big markets for us to target with our technology. It's got a, our technology has to have an exploitable competitive advantage. So our technology really has to give us uh, a big technology moat with whatever else is around to solve these global challenges. And of course, the other thing we've got to do is we've got to deliver uh, scale uh, with this solution uh, and we've got to do it quickly. So they're the key parameters that we use to choose which particular industries we're going to be targeting. Just on sustainability, which is, which is really core to the company. Uh, as a company, we're providing sustainability solutions, but of course, we're also uh, looking at our own performance with respect to sustainability. Uh, we've uh, had some targets in there for FY23, uh, reaffirming our commitment to the United Nations uh, Global Compact. Uh, we've got a new uh, board committee established uh, directly associated with sustainability. Uh, and we've done our first greenhouse gas uh, baseline assessment for our activities. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing in FY24, uh, we're going to be looking at our own emissions reduction roadmap. Uh, we're going to prioritise gender diversity at all levels of the company, measure and reduce waste, uh, with the ambition of 100% sustainable uh, inputs to the business by 2030. Uh, and our 2030 sustain 2023 sorry, sustainability report is coming out later this year. So watch this space on that one. So just in terms of uh, highlights for the year just gone, uh, if we have a look across uh, back across the last 12 months, there's been pretty substantial uh, progress made across all areas of the company. Um, first of all, uh, key uh, F, uh, achievement for us was to sign the first license agreement for our CO2 mitigation technology in lime and cement with Heidelberg materials. Um, not only was it first for us, it's a first of a kind for the industry uh, to have a royalty type arrangement or license type arrangement for application of the technology in that particular area. Hugely important for us. Uh, we've completed uh, some institutional and uh, also a share purchase plan placement across uh, October and November last year. And Darren will talk about the strength of our balance sheet moving forward as a result of that placement. Um, we had some uh, funding award from ARENA for our iron and steel decarbonisation project, and I'll talk a little more about that a bit further down in the presentation. Um, with CEMEX, again, with our CO2 abatement uh, technology for lime and cement, we announced three projects and progress on developing a, a commercial arrangement with CEMEX uh, for the application of the technology. Uh, and also, uh, I mentioned before, our joint venture with Pilbara Minerals. Uh, in November, we formalised that. And post balance sheet uh, or post uh, end date uh, financial year, just in August, a few weeks ago, we announced the progress of that project past our final investment decision. Uh, so that project I'll talk a little bit about as well. Uh, some few other uh, little surprises, I guess, uh, not foreseen at the start of the year. Uh, there was a green methanol project uh, that was successful in getting some funding from ARENA and the German government uh, to start to progress uh, the use of CO2 that's captured uh, from say lime production in the production of green methanol. I'll talk a bit about the importance of that when it comes to things like green shipping and green aviation. And lastly, um, another one that uh, perhaps wasn't foreseen at the very start of the year, which uh, progressed very nicely for us was the signing of a, a memorandum of understanding with a company called Heirloom, Bill Gates backed direct air capture technology. Uh, and only recently some pretty significant announcements have emerged around direct air capture in the United States that are very exciting. So a year that was quite uh, really um, uh, very positive for us. Uh, we mark ourselves, of course, uh, fairly harshly. We've got, we set our ambitions pretty high, 
Uh, across the board, uh, we did pretty well. I think we, we certainly did the whole lot better than a pass. Let's call it a credit, somewhere in between a credit and a distinction. But um, we'll talk about our water business and the progress that's really starting to make, uh, which is excellent. Um, in biotech, uh, we had uh, uh, quite a good progress across all areas in terms of crop protection, marine coatings, and a new biotech application. A little bit uh, delayed in a couple of those areas, uh, which is why we sort of marked ourselves down a bit. Uh, but even since the end of the year, some really into the financial year, sorry, some really interesting progress there. In advanced batteries also, again, we marked ourselves pretty hard on our first commercial format battery, not quite being ready by the end of the year. And of course, since the end of the year, that started to come on now. And I'll talk a little bit about that. In sustainable processing, uh, very good progress there. We decided not to pursue uh, refractories just at this point in time. It's a tiny market compared to what we're focusing on in spodumene, iron and steel, and now emerging in aluminium. And lastly, in lilac, uh, we did pretty well. We converted uh, a full license agreement. That was the uh, the Heidelberg license agreement. We didn't quite get there on a couple of others that have been negotiated, but watch this space. Uh, and in Lilac 2, uh, we had a little bit of a delay in permitting there, and I'll talk a bit about that delay, but uh, we've started to procure long lead items. And in fact, the site works have now commenced again since the end of the financial year. So overall, uh, a pretty good result, a credit, let's call it a credit, uh, six, six and a half out of 10 or so we'll give ourselves, um, but some substantial progress uh, across multiple different parts of our business. So just, I guess, on the financials, I'll hand over to Darren to have a quick chat through where we're sitting. Yeah, thanks, Phil, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm really happy to be here and, and present our financial results for, for FY23, um, a year in which, again, uh, we, we achieved a lot, uh, notwithstanding uh, marking ourselves down in a couple of spots. Uh, the company continues to, to kick many goals across all of the areas of the business that we're, we're investing in, applying the, the, the technology platform to. Um, uh, so in terms of kind of high level numbers, um, you know, the, the key issue that, that we, uh, you know, we set out to, to achieve over, the, over the, uh, the financial year was to continue to build our team, to build a team of talented people to help uh, deliver against the promise of the technology and the opportunity that it, portray, uh, it provides for us. Um, as we can see on the screen, we've, we've added over 37 people in, in engineering and R&D across the various different um, areas of business. And, and we're also expanding our production capability, particularly in the water business, which I'll come and talk about a little bit more um, in the next few slides. We've also continued to invest in, in um, uh, various different uh, 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 assets that we're, we're building. Um, again, uh, US production capability, which I'll touch on, um, some facilities down at Bacchus Marsh as we flagged at the cap raise last year to improve our ability to turn around testing and things like that. Um, also, obviously, we've, we've started the project, uh, uh, we've been working on the project with Pilbara, and as Phil mentioned, we've, we've started long lead procurement items with Lilac. Lilac too. Um, so, so for me, pleasingly, uh, our overall revenue result was was very strong for the year, up forty two percent on the last financial year, um, and uh, uh, as well at the same time, what was in what was what was pleasing within the water business, we've seen significant increase in gross margin and gross profit. Um, so, so really, kind of delivering on the on the promise that we've previously talked about in terms of identifying those customers who who we can develop you know good service and relationships with, deliver quality product, and, and get good return on our on our um, investment on. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the balance sheet at, at 30 June, we had close to 75 million dollars. Uh, in cash in the in, in the bank, uh, and again, I'll talk about uh, you know kind of where we're positioned on the balance sheet to to move forward in the next few slides as well. So, just just drive, um, honing in then on the um, uh, the P and L, as I said, a forty two percent increase in revenue, a very strong contribution in, um, from our water business. Um, we touched on at the, at, at the first half results how we were encouraged by the performance that we we're seeing and growth in in the US um, and in Australia, in fact. Uh, in the US, our business uh, grew over 28% in the second half compared to the same time last year. Um, and that was even before we've been able to sort of complete and, and leverage some, some additional production capability that we're building in the US, in, in Texas, uh, and also uh, in Wisconsin. So, so we're really positioned um, very well to kind of continue to, to grow that US water business. Uh, we've also obviously achieved very significant contribution of, for our revenue, top line revenue in terms of our grants and rebates. There are a lot of incentives um, that uh, uh, and, and programs that we've been able to kind of tap into and co-invest with 
with our shareholder funds, with various governments around the world, both here in Australia with our research and development tax incentive and in Europe, obviously, with, with the LILAC funding. So, so again, very strong uh, revenue growth. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of our operating expenses and our operating result, again, we, we sort of set out a plan when we came to shareholders in, in October, November last year that, that with, with the tailwinds that we're seeing and the interest that we were seeing in the technology, we really wanted to continue to build out our team, and we've certainly done that. Um, again, with the majority of the investment in, in R&D and engineering to support all of the activities that we're doing. So um, in, terms of, in terms of from where I sit, um, you know, no surprises in terms of, of, of the investment and the activity and very strong and positive performance in terms of revenue growth. Just, just on the balance sheet then again, um, uh, key, key take out from me and, and, and as I sit here as the CFO of the company, we've got a very strong and clean balance sheet to, to take the business uh, uh, and support the business as it moves forward. Um, you know, we've got significant amounts of kind of uh, uh, cash in the balance sheet to pursue our activities. Um, we, ha we have no debt, uh, which, which, is, which is fantastic. And um, yeah, we, we, we're really set up to pursue the, uh, the activities that we've set out over the course of the next couple of years. What we've got as well is, is strong flexibility as various different projects and opportunities emerge to, to, to kind of identify the optimum way to fund those activities uh, as, as they emerge as well. So, so really strong kind of financial position for us, one that I'm very happy about um, and, and one that sets us up uh, you know, as we move forward. Just the final final few comments from me in terms of our operating um, uh, uh, cash flows. Again, essentially, um, you know, we've been we've been investing in building our team to be able to uh, take advantage of the platform that we, we're developing. Um, there has been an increase in working capital. Primarily, that's associated with the timing on when it, when when we'll receive some of our grants. Uh, in this next couple of month period, there's there's some significant cash inflows associated with R&D tax incentives and things like that. Um, but um, but all in all, like I said, it, essentially the operating cash flows reflect the operating performance that was on the previous tab. So um, again, no, nothing in terms of surprises from my perspective. Um, in terms of our, our plant and equipment and our IP, what are we investing the money in? As I said, we're, we're building two new um, production facilities in the US. We've seen significant growth off our existing platform. Um, manufacturing platform that we have there. Um, it's, it's given us the confidence to, to continue to expand east in terms of the US from our Pacific Northwest base into Texas and, and Wisconsin, as I mentioned, and, and those plants will come online. Uh, we're, we're commissioning one, I think, at the moment, uh, and another one will be ready in, in, in the next month or two. So really, really set up for, for, for continued strong growth in the US. As Phil mentioned before, we started procurement of long lead items for LILAC 2, and that's included in the property plant and equipment line there. Um, and, and again, very exciting um, from my perspective. Um, you know, we've been investing in, in our midstream project with, with Pilbara Minerals. Um, that's uh, an unincorporated joint venture, which will be accounted for as a joint operation. Um, and again, Phil will talk a little bit more about that, but it's essentially a, a, a production facility that will produce a lithium phosphate salt. Um, Calix has capped its, its investment in that plan at $17.5 million. It's a $105 million project, but we will own 45% of that. So 45% of the revenues and expenses and the, and the facility will, will be uh, 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 you know, into our balance sheet and, and accounts you know, as that plant is, is constructed. So, so, you know, for me, um, the, in terms of the placement that we completed and the position that we're in right now, um, you know, we, we're, we're really well set up for the next two plus years um, with the current project commitments and, and we've got a very strong position to, to kind of keep, keep pursuing these, uh, these opportunities that uh, the strong tailwinds that Phil will talk about provide for us. Over you, Phil. Excellent. Thanks very much. Darren, and, and just taking on Darren Seymour about, about the tailwinds uh, and why we're making all this investment in people. Uh, it's really uh, a snapshot here just across a few jurisdictions across Europe, US and Australia. Uh, we've seen dramatic uh, change in policies uh, and commitments, uh, not only from a political perspective, but also from uh, the corporate perspective over the course of the last two years. Uh, and all of these uh, are really fueling a decarbonisation effort that 
um, that our technology is very well placed to, to take advantage of. I won't go through any of these in detail, but this pack is available through the uh, ASX platform, uh, but you can see there just as, as a snapshot across three jurisdictions, what is happening. Um, and even here in Australia, uh, where two years ago, uh, not a whole lot was happening, uh, we're starting to see uh, real, uh, I guess, uh, pace of change here in terms of decarbonisation. Uh, and the way industry uh, is starting to react uh, is refreshing. Um, and, and so, uh, again, we're very well placed even here in Australia, whereas our focus previously had, had mainly been in Europe and the States. We're certainly focusing on some interesting projects here in Australia as well now. Um, just moving through then, each of the lines of business, Lilac is our, uh, our name for our low emissions intensity lime and cement. That's the CO2 capture for lime and cement. Uh, I mentioned before, it's a lime and cement are sort of 8% of global CO2 emissions. Uh, but there's a real drivers to, to decarbonising uh, that industry. Uh, we talk a, a little bit about jurisdictions and, and some of the policies that are coming in place in, the, in Europe. Uh, the, the penalty for emitting a tonne of CO2 uh, is you've got to go on market and buy a permit. That's uh, exceeded uh, 100 euro per tonne uh, recently. Uh, and so that penalty, if you like, is, is really driving the cement and lime companies there to look at their decarbonisation efforts. And in the US, the recent introduction of the Inflation Reduction Act saw uh, the tax incentive increase to 85 US a tonne uh, for carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, and so these uh, tailwinds, I guess, from a policy perspective are really driving uh, a lot of the behaviours we're seeing from industry. Uh, but not only that, the industries themselves, their stakeholders, their shareholders are also demanding plans for net zero. Uh, and that, of course, is also driving across the globe, not just where there's policy jurisdiction, uh, across the globe decarbonisation efforts uh, by these major companies. Just in terms of our solution, where are we at? Uh, we have uh, built in 2019 the first pilot project there. That's uh, 25,000 tonne per annum separation capacity unit at, uh, uh, at a Heidelberg cement facility in Lixa in Belgium. Uh, that's the second largest operating facility in the world in terms of CO2 separation today on a cement plant. Uh, in fact, the largest outside of China. Uh, so already at scale, even though we call it pilot, uh, Lilac 2, which is a four-tube version of that module, uh, targeting 100,000 tonnes per annum of CO2 separation uh, at, a, at a Heidelberg cement facility in Hanover in Germany. Uh, I'll talk a bit, bit about where we're at on, on that particular project, uh, but that will be our module. And then from that module, we'll then scale to what we call Lilac 3, multi, you know, which is getting up to sort of 20 or 25 tubes uh, of those tubes in, uh, that are focused on the CO2 separation there. Um, and you can see along the bottom there, the industry uh, partners that we're working with there, none of which are, are minor players by any sense of the imagination. Port of Rotterdam, by the way, announced overnight uh, environmental approval uh, for the setup of their CO2 sequestration hub in Europe, the largest in Europe. Uh, so a partner on our project there uh, and a very important player um, in ultimately what's gonna be happening with the CO2. There's, a, a, I guess, a full-scale vision of what our Lilac facility, uh, the Lilac 3 facility will look like on a cement plant. Uh, to give everyone an, a, a sense of uh, how big an opportunity this is, uh, we'd need to build one, two of these a week between now and 2050 uh, to mitigate the CO2 emissions from the cement and lime industries. Uh, so that's how big an issue it is for them and how big an opportunity it is for us. Um, Key highlights during the year, I talked a bit about the Heidelberg license agreement that was executed. Uh, it's a royalty or license type mechanism. Uh, very important for us to establish this uh, because that establishes our business model in this area. Uh, there's a royalty floor, there's a variable component and a cap. Uh, we can't disclose exactly what they are, but uh, you can imagine uh, in terms of typical royalty rates, uh, we're in that typical range, uh, low being sort of 2%, high being 10%. So we're probably somewhere in the middle there of the value of a tonne of CO2. Uh, so with 1.4 billion tonnes of CO2 to be uh, mitigated uh, potentially uh, using our technology and uh, royalties of, of those sorts of multiples of euros, you can start to get a sense of what license total addressable market uh, that we're looking at here with the technology, which is substantial. Um, just in terms of uh, other areas, again, we announced uh, uh, the methanol, green methanol project in South Australia during the year. Uh, that one there, we're working with uh, a number of companies, Vast Solar uh, and Arena and the German government are tipping in some money there too. Um, why green methanol? Uh, 
If you take green hydrogen, combine that with CO2 to make methanol, uh, methanol is one of those things uh, that is being targeted to decarbonise shipping and potentially aviation. You can take the methanol and convert that into a synthetic aviation fuel. Uh, and that's off the shelf technology today. So it's not as if this is uh, uh, huge technical advancements that still need to take place. Uh, so this particular project here, which will be in South Australia, is quite exciting. To give you an idea of how things quickly are moving, how quickly things are moving in the shipping space, Maersk recently announced that their next 25 vessels will be dual fuel, including methanol. Uh, so methanol is really starting to come to the fore in terms of the green shipping solution. So a very exciting project there for us. And the last uh, advance during the year was uh, the announcement of this uh, memorandum of understanding with the heirloom, uh, Bill Gates backed uh, direct air capture technology. Uh, direct air capture is capturing CO2 directly from the air. And in this case, with the heirloom technology, they're using uh, what's called calcium looping. Uh, so the calcium goes through our lilac technology uh, out into heirlooms uh, equipment and, and in that equipment it absorbs the CO2, turns it back into limestone and then it cycles back through our equipment again. Pretty exciting project um, and just in the last few weeks uh, Project Cyprus of which heirloom is a part uh, was one of two hubs for direct air capture named for 1.2 billion US in support under the US Department of Energy's uh, direct air capture program. Uh, so um, this particular MOU outlines a uh, royalty as well, uh, in this case three US dollars per tonne of CO2 captured through our technology. So it's a light capital touch, uh, high margin royalty type business model we're pursuing here. Uh, and heirloom are targeting a billion tonnes of capture by 2035. Now, hugely ambitious. If they get a tenth or even a hundredth of the way there, it still represents a substantial opportunity for us. So very pleased with that particular project. Lastly, uh, just in terms of the pipeline within the Lilac Group, uh, we've got uh, 76 projects now in that pipeline. Uh, so that pipeline is really built over the course of the last two years. Um, and with, within those projects, we've started to see some movement down the pipeline. Two projects in defeat, including Tarmac. Uh, we've got three new projects that we can talk about with Semex. Uh, Adbri, we're continuing to work with on a facility here in Australia. Um, and Lilac 2, obviously, as well, which is in FID, past FID and in construction now. So demolition has started on the site works there. We had a bit of a hold up. We had some bats uh, taking up residence in this uh, disused tower that needed to be demolished. That delayed the permitting somewhat. Uh, so that will push us back a little bit uh, on our commissioning into 2025. Uh, but that demolition has now started and the long lead item procurements is now on the way. So I like to moving, uh, albeit uh, a little bit uh, frustrating uh, in terms of the permitting delays. Just moving through into sustainable processing, we mentioned before the project with Pilbara Minerals, that has now passed its final investment decision. Uh, we're targeting that one to uh, start uh, construction uh, this financial year uh, and targeting the first production of lithium salts uh, moving into um, financial year, uh, next financial year. Uh, so uh, let's call it early calendar year 25. Uh, the CapEx has moved up a little bit on there, not surprisingly, given the inflation, uh, inflationary impacts that have run through uh, the economy. Uh, however, we've kept our capital commitment, as Darren mentioned, at 17 and a half million. Uh, and so effectively our uh, free carry has increased in that project. Uh, so we still have 45% equity in that project. It's targeting 3000 tons of lithium phosphate salt. Uh, street value today, just of the lithium in that salt is about 85 US million. So a significant project for us, a demonstration project. Uh, but still uh, of small commercial consequence. Um, and uh, the lithium phosphate salt uh, in and of itself obviously has some quite some utility in terms of its uh, lower carbon footprint, uh, provided we can make it with renewable electrons, uh, but also in terms of uh, the way uh, lithium iron phosphate salts are really increasing the auto industry. Um, and so the ability to deliver the two molecules uh, effectively for the price of one, uh, we think will, uh, and we're certainly getting very strong indication, which is fed in the FID decision. Uh, that particular new type of phosphate salt product is going to be of high interest to the battery industry. Uh, just in terms of uh, our iron and steel, key thing here, uh, we were targeting to complete uh, an ore program over the course of uh, the last three months of the last financial year, just the last quarter. Uh, we've extended that oil program given the demand coming in. We're now testing iron oil from just about every iron oil producer in Australia and uh, at least one offshore. Uh, and the offshore interest is starting to increase as well. So we've expanded our program. 
uh, and we'll be running that uh, ore testing program over the course of this quarter and next quarter. Um, this particular project is supported uh, nearly a million dollars in ARENA grant funding. Target here is to put together a 30,000 tonne per annum demonstration facility, uh, a front end engineering design, uh, and then look at uh, where and how we build that uh, as a first of a kind demonstration facility. The key advantage of our technology here, same core technology, uh, but the key advantage is that we minimise green hydrogen use in making green iron, uh, which is the most expensive part. Uh, it's a highly exciting project for us, a lot of interest coming in, and an extended ore program uh, is what we'll be focusing on in the first half of this financial year. Just under advanced, advanced batteries, uh, really targeting here to make some interesting manganese-based materials. Uh, and also we're starting to look at iron-based materials. Uh, again, it's the unique properties of our kiln uh, without uh, contaminating uh, these materials and maximising surface area and targeting the crystal structures we want uh, that's our competitive advantage. Um, we were a little slow in getting our first commercial format together. We missed our target, as I mentioned, uh, by the end of the last financial year. However, that commercial format pack is now ready. Uh, it has started cycle testing. Uh, and it is demonstrating great performance in terms of high power. Uh, we still need to work through the cycle performance, but the high power performance is definitely there. Uh, and so uh, obviously there's some areas that we're starting to look at as to where high power is really um, uh, an advantage uh, and uh, power tools and these sorts of things could be quite an interesting area to look at this first material that we've produced. We're also looking at um, lithium ion phosphate, as I mentioned before, and also adding a little bit of nickel to increase the energy density. So our battery program is progressing well, uh, albeit a little delayed on the commercial format cell, but that cell has now been constructed and is undergoing the cycling testing. Just on the biotech side of the business, uh, this particular area I, I, I still see is highly prospective for us. Uh, if you have a look down the market trends on the right hand side, uh, these don't get quite the same air time as decarbonisation, but they will. Uh, in terms of antimicrobial resistance and the rise in that, um, I think uh, that sort of area will start to get a whole lot of focus as this decade closes out. Uh, we have a unique uh, product here in, in a high surface area, ma magnesium oxide material we make again with our core technology uh, and in agriculture, marine and in uh, biotech, uh, specific biotech areas there, such as for veterinary applications, uh, we're really starting to get some great results and make some good progress. Um, in agriculture, we're collaborating with a, a cooperative. We're in our second year of extended field trials, like not just a, a tiny plot. These are uh, hundreds of hectares of, of application. Um, and really there, when, uh, the cooperative is looking at the replacement of a fungicide called Mancozeb. Uh, so that's progressing well. Marine coatings, this is replacing all uh, as much as possible, the copper that sits on the bottom of boats that uh, ultimately peels off and fouls the sea with uh, pretty poisonous material. Uh, some great results there. We're working with two coating companies uh, and they're starting uh, what they call their dynamic tests uh, on that. Uh, and lastly, antimicrobial resistance. A little late getting this one uh, through the clinical trial stage, which is where we wanted to get to last year. Uh, but the, the, the part that we're playing in the CRC safe uh, and, and safe is the uh, solving antimicrobial resistance in, in agribusiness, food and environment. So it's a rather long acronym, uh, but that one there, uh, they're starting to use our magnesium oxide materials to focus on livestock health management. Um, so that's a, a, a quite exciting area there that uh, the product's now moving into as well under a, a structured research program with uh, all of the safe CRC uh, participants. So lots happening on the biotech front. And lastly, in water, as Darren mentioned, um, I think water itself has uh, had a great year and we're very pleased with what's happening in the, in the US uh, as far as growth is concerned. Really starting to see the growth uh, stalled a little bit, I guess, during the COVID era. Uh, but now that that's uh, over, uh, we're moving through much more efficiently now to establish those new production centres. Uh, uh, we've already seeded sales in Texas. Uh, and that plant has been commissioning now, a uh, huge opportunity there. And the Wisconsin plant is also under construction targeting uh, before the end of this year for completion there to expand there as well. So the US really starting to organically grow uh, very nicely for us. And so I'm very pleased with what's happening in the water business. Just in terms of what we wanna to do to prioritize next financial year, or should I say this financial year, um, the electrification of industrial processing and the unavoidable CO2 emission capture 
part of our business continues to be a major focus. There's no doubt there's enormous opportunities opening up there. Um, the pipeline, as you saw in the like, is building as it is in sustainable processing, covering iron and steel, uh, 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 spodumene and, and lithium production, and also now uh, alumina is emerging as an area there too. Um, we're going to be combining our water and biotech business into magnesia. Magnesia is the source, if you like, of all of the uh, uh, activity in that line of business, in those two lines of business. So we're going to combine it into one to simplify our overall business. Um, and we're going to continue to look at our battery materials as well. There's great progress we've made there in terms of getting this commercial, first commercial format cell and this couple of very prospective chemistries following on behind. So just in terms of our KPIs uh, for the coming year, uh, CO2 capture there. Um, we've got to get Lilac 2 uh, moving as quick as possible. So we want to get all of that permitting uh, and the civil works complete on that site and construction commenced. Um, and so hopefully if the bats are moved safely out of that tower that's been demolished, we'll, we'll get um, that all underway. Um, we're going to continue to move those projects down the pipeline. Plenty in the pipeline. It's all about movement this year. Uh, and lastly, um, a green methanol consortium project. We want to get to basis of design on that. Just in terms of sustainable processing, we want to get uh, the construction started, of course, on the project with Pilbara Minerals. Um, and with respect to our iron and steel application called Zesty, uh, we want to complete that front end engineering design, uh, leading to a financial investment decision uh, to move ahead and build that particular demonstration facility. And that will also be um, contingent upon and, and be informed by this expanded ore program that I talked about earlier, which we've, we're now going to extend over most of the rest of this calendar year, given the interest and the demand that's come in. Uh, and in Illumina, uh, I'll talk a bit more about this as we move through the year. Um, we have started to look at what uh, the application of the technology uh, in refining uh, aluminium trihydroxide or aluminium hydrate down to alumina, uh, a very potentially uh, significant application for us. Um, and so that one there, we're putting a bit of upfront investment into. Um, advanced batteries, uh, we'll get that uh, commercial format uh, cell tested and cycled out. And so that's a key KPI for us. Uh, we're gonna complete the front end engineering design on a okay. cathode production facility. Uh, and we're gonna look at um, uh, these other new uh, chemistries that we've started to develop and how we can put that into, uh, again, a commercial format to fully test out the cycling capability there. Lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, in magnesia, water and biotech continue down their pathways. Uh, so very pleased with both of those businesses and the progress they're making uh, under the one banner of magnesia, but also we're adding their uh, magnesium metal a highly uh, critical uh, material in aerospace, uh, dare I say defence, uh, but requiring significant decarbonisation. So there's uh, some opportunities that we're seeing in magnesium metal. Uh, we're going to have a look at what our technology can do to help decarbonise magnesium metal, uh, and that'll be a, a basis of design for a plant that we're targeting this year. So, so that sort of summarises all the things where we're going after this year and hopefully summarises the year that's just gone as well. Happy to answer any questions, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Phil and Darren. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please do so by the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. All right, the uh, first question, uh, can you please provide some colour on the spodumene uh, pricing mechanism with Pilbara Minerals? Uh, this is considering that the midstream project could be fed entirely from run of mine fines that cannot be used in conventional kilns. What discount pricing may be applied to the offtake spodumene price fed into the plant? Yeah, so so on that one there, the the transfer price, if you like, between Pilbara Minerals is, and us is, is is commercial in confidence. But suffice to say, they do get paid fair value uh, for their spodumene fines. The fact that those uh, if those spodumene fines are very low in lithium or too fine to be fed in any kiln, then obviously they're very, very low value. Uh, so we're going to be undertaking a whole series of tests to determine what actual concentration, what particle size is best suited uh, to, for the uh, for the midstream uh, salt facility. Um, but suffice to say, the the uh, the actual final grade of that uh, and size of that material that's going into the plant is going to be subject to that testing as we undertake that in early twenty five. Thank you, Phil. Um, also, what are the difficulties in going beyond 98% uh, lithium phosphate purity with the midstream and achieving battery grade products? 
Yeah, so the aim with the midstream plant is not necessarily to target what we call battery grade. The whole idea and, and the word midstream is about the fact that what you're doing is transporting a lithium ion and a phosphate uh, ion, if you like, to a battery materials producer. They've got quite some capability to further refine that material to what we then call battery grade materials. Um, and so the interest, if you like, from, from those players is, is, was critical. Uh, in terms of us coming to a final investment decision on that particular project. Uh, and suffice to say, we were highly encouraged by the interest shown by those battery materials companies. So to be clear, we're not targeting battery grade material X and mine site. And, and I would only add, those who are, um, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and so we feel that a midstream project and a midstream solution for a mine site is actually the optimum solution, which is why we ran with it. Oh, thank you, Phil. Um, can you please provide any efforts to drive down the CapEx or the Calix uh, kiln technology? Given your modular design, are there any discussions with specialised plant with builders or fabricators that may help drive down the upfront cost of construction and the time to build your kilns? Look, absolutely. Uh, if you if you have a look at uh, at how many tubes we need, how many shell casings, uh, how many uh, modules uh, we may need as we decarbonise industry, there is huge opportunity to drive the cost down. Um, we are, of course, we are talking to multiple different fabricators, manufacturers, engineering firms, etc. Um, one thing I will say is. Uh, you know, certain, certainly if we have a look at, uh, say, for heirloom, for example, uh, part of the uh, the royalty regime uh, benefits us in terms of the royalty payment as the costs come down. So mass, if you like, mass manufacturing techniques are absolutely in our sights to uh, get the costs down for these uh, facilities. The other thing is if you have a look at the uh, Heidelberg Cement Agreement, for example, um, that one there, uh, because it's a pure license arrangement, uh, what we like about that and, and what made it, I guess, a win-win with Heidelberg Materials is they can use their procurement muscle to drive down the cost of our technology. We don't mind who makes the tube, who makes the, the structure. Um, and so uh, that agreement's great because we can use others' procurement muscle to drive down the cost of our technology, which only improves, uh, obviously, it, its techno-economics. Um, so, yeah, very, very much at front of mind uh, as to how we continue to do that, and there's huge opportunity to do so, given uh, the potential application of the technology across all these different areas. Uh, and as I say, it's the, the same one core technology. Uh, how many tubes will we need? How many uh, furnace casings? Uh, all of those things uh, will help drive down the cost of the technology substantially. Thank you, Phil. Uh, next question. So um, other income rose year on year primarily, primarily due to your R&D incentive income. Would it be right to assume that that's in relation to income from the EU Horizon program, the LILAC 2, um, and there's a Another bit to that question, but I'll answer that one first. Yeah, no, in fact, it's not. It's primarily associated with incentives that we get in here in Australia. Um, so, so essentially, I flagged that we've made a significant investment in our, in our people and our engineering and R&D capability. Um, so, so we've been able to take advantage of, of, uh, of incentives that the Australian government have, uh, have provide for, for, for our activity in those areas. So, so there's, in fact, LILAC is, uh, I think it's, and again, it's it's in the annual report. It's it's certainly less than fifteen or twenty percent of the amount of of other income that we've we've reported this year. Thank you, Darren. And uh, just adding to that, so an extension to that question: Are you able to provide some guidance on R and D incentive receipts for twenty four? Uh, will they be higher or lower than FY twenty three? Um, look, it, it, it's it's. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, in terms of where we are as a business, we typically don't provide guidance in terms of, uh, uh, you know, specifics around revenues and, uh, uh, you know, expenses and things like that. But what I can say is that, um, you know, we've been very 
fortunate um, to, to be uh, well connected and well engaged with, with governments, both domestically and internationally. And we've been well supported with what we've been doing um, through grants and rebates, either either here in Australia or in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're increasingly looking to the US as well. Uh, in terms of our our R and D and our engineering, it's a fine balance between um, you know continuing to invest to take advantage of the technology platform um, uh, and and uh, you know go after the opportunities that we believe represent significant value, future value for shareholders, um, and making sure we've got access to grants and research uh, rebates uh, etc to help fund them. So, so but fair to say we've got um, significant grants already secured around things like Lilac 2. And as Phil mentioned, there are some other things like the Highgate project and, and Arena. We, we actually haven't drawn down on the Arena grant yet for, for, for Zesty. Um, so, and, 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 you know, we, as I said, we continue to be well supported and have a good working relationship. So, so at this point, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the with the balance sheet, um, with the with the access to capital that we have um, to to kind of pursue the opportunities that we've got in front of us. Um, um, and you know, it's fair to say, like I said, we, we we continue to be very well supported by by the various governments and centres um, uh, uh, that are that are kind of uh, in the areas in which we we've, we've, we've got people. Um, Thank you, Darren. Um, to the best of your ability, are you able to provide any colour on your progress progress with uh, Chemex regarding the pending commercial agreement? And if you're progressing discussions with any other potential commercial partners for your Lilac technology? Yes, we, we, we certainly are. Um, and uh, I can't provide any more colour than that, unfortunately. Um, one of the things you'll notice about our KPIs, uh, we, we, I think, I think we've done ourselves a bit of a disservice setting um, a certain number of uh, agreements to move from this particular phase to that particular phase. Um, I don't think that that serves us in the best interest when it comes to negotiating those agreements. Um, and so we're not going to hold us, uh, we're not going to put those out in, in terms of a timeline. Um, we need to get the best outcome for Calix and its shareholders. Uh, and so the commercial arrangements, uh, we're not going to uh, um, rush to get something done for the sake of ticking a box. Um, but having said that, uh, all of, you know, there's several commercial discussions happening right now, obviously, and we'll update the market as and when we can on um, substantive progress on those. Thank you, Phil. Um, is the lithium to be pr produced by Pilbara plant, by the Pilbara plant, going to provide a nano active lithium and if so is it likely to sell at a premium uh no when we're not targeting uh nano activity with this particular area we're using the unique properties of the kiln uh to maximize recovery of the lithium so when when we when we uh break open if you like or when we heat up those fine particles of spodumene we're breaking open that ore uh, and the temperature control there is all about limiting the melting of other materials that covers up the cracks that you've made as you broke it open. So the particular aspect of the technology that's of advantage there, apart from the fact that you can heat it, to heat the, to the kiln renewably, uh, is the fact that we have very fine temperature control to limit that melting. Uh, so no, we're not targeting nano activity. Um, what we are targeting is utility. So what we're targeting there is that, that a molecule of lithium and a molecule of phosphate are both of value uh, to a potential battery producer, especially as lithium ion phosphate becomes uh, and is the fastest growing uh, EV battery chemistry today. Um, and so the ability to provide two molecules in the one uh, that cuts down the carbon footprint, obviously, and transport costs and, and all these sorts of things, they're, they're where uh, we see potential upside in terms of value of lithium content. We haven't relied or quoted anything about that with respect to uh, the potential revenue that we might see from that particular plant. We're hopeful we can get uh, value upside, but until we actually secure that, we won't uh, obviously be claiming that just at this point. All right, thank you, Phil. Uh, that concludes the Q&A segment. Um, we'll get back to those individuals whose questions we didn't have time to, to answer. Um, so I'll throw it back to you, Phil, for closing remarks. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. Look, thanks everyone for your time again this morning. Uh, obviously, uh, quite a, a, an exciting year in the past uh, with quite a few advances across the multiple parts of our business. Uh, this particular year, uh, we're going to start to see some uh, real traction on the ground in terms of physical things being built. Obviously, there's uh, the Pilbara Minerals project, there's the Lilac 2 project. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, start to move quickly to close out formally around the opportunities in direct air capture uh, and the green methanol opportunity. Uh, so quite an exciting year coming up with respect to uh, steel, bolts, uh, civils, uh, and actual projects starting to appear. Uh, so really looking forward to that um, and uh, going to be a very exciting year commercially for us as well. So um, thanks everyone again for your time, your interest and your support in Calyx.